Welcome, this is a recorded session of the Post-Quantum Cryptography Conference of the PKI Consortium. This conference would not have been possible without our sponsors in Trust, HID Global, and PQ Shield, and the organizational support of the Post-Quantum Cryptography Working Group of the PKI Consortium, in particular in Trust, Logius, TNO, and CWI. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, hope you had a good uh, break. Uh, enjoyed some coffee and some conversation. We have uh, uh, a block of presentations to go through here. And I think uh, um, as I introduce the, the first speaker here, this is actually a, uh, a topic that is near to dear to my heart is, uh, you know, from a technology standpoint, that's great. We understand the technology and the technology problem. But at some point in time, we all have to go and explain this to others in our organization and help them understand what's, uh, what's in scope to this problem and uh, why they need to be concerned about a problem that, uh, that doesn't appear on the quarterly or quarter to quarter management of the business. So uh, with that, love to uh, introduce, it's my pleasure to introduce Robert. Uh, Robert Hahn is from Entrust. Uh, yesterday he bugged me about my profile and uh, so I'm gonna cut his back seriously as well. But uh, Robert is uh, based in the UK and he's Global Vice President of Sales, Center of Excellence at Entrust. He specializes in PKI, all things management. Uh, identity management based and trust services. Uh, prior to joining uh, uh, in trust, uh, he was co-owner of Trustus, uh, which was a UK uh, based managed cryptography services provider that a trust acquired in 2017. So Robert, please welcome to the stage. No. No, it's the microphone. <clears throat> Well, um, it's, it's a pleasure and honor to present in, in front of such a, uh, a prestigious group of people, experts in cryptography. Normally, I get away with the fact that the audience is not expert in cryptography, so please go easy on me. Um, and, of course, to our remote audience as well, not forgetting uh, them. So um, <clears throat> one of the biggest challenges we're facing is getting the journey started for post-quantum readiness. I hear it all the time. So I'm going to talk about a way that it can work, and it is working in organizations I've met around the world. So I'm going to talk about a bit, firstly, set the scene around how managing cryptography happens today and the challenges. What are the board priorities? Zero trust adoption and maturity, just for those that weren't too familiar with it. Uh, it's not always a, uh, um, a topic that people are uh, familiar with. What are the common journey elements between the two journeys? Uh, where can PQC help with your maturity? It's sort of a forward-looking statement around uh, how we can use PQC to improve our security in, in that framework, and then a couple of recommendations. So a day in the life of managing cryptography. So these are statements that I've heard for the last five to 10 years from CISOs, from risk experts, from uh, compliance teams, security teams, and business people. These shouldn't be new. I'm sure you've all heard them or felt them in your lives as, as people who try to manage cryptography to best practices. There's a common assumption that we've spent the money, we bought that PKI, we bought the cryptographic system, all is good with the world. And, it do, and we know it doesn't work that way. It's a constant process of checking, re-risk assessing, making sure that the new threats are being mitigated and so on. But from a business perspective, I've signed off the check, we've bought it, we're good. We can now spend our money on the next thing. Risks are unknown because we don't know what we're dealing with. And that's a fundamental thing in post-quantum readiness. It's step one on the journey. Discover what cryptographic assets you have. Get clear visibility. There's no scanning tool in the world that will find everything cryptographic asset-wise. You'll get to, at best, about 75%. And everything else you have to capture manually in your project initiations and your supply chain questionnaires and, and so on. Um, if you don't know what you've got, you don't know what your risks are. And that's fundamentally one of the biggest challenges that we all face 
in managing cryptography day to day is that if we don't know what we've got, we don't know whether we're at risk, we're out of date or, or whatever. Crypto resources are scarce and expensive. This is a people problem and it's all over the world. The universities don't produce enough crypto experts to fulfill all the crypto jobs, plain and simple. We're in demand. I'm not sure we're all expensive, um, but we're in demand and therefore we will get job offers from other companies looking for our, our expertise and we leave with valuable knowledge in our heads, which leads us on quite, not in, in, in line here, but leads us on to the other issue, which is, is policies and procedures being out of date. They were perfect when we built that PKI five years ago. They matched exactly what that PKI was gonna be used for. The CP, CPS told us how we were going to achieve that policy, the security controls and everything. Five years on, the PKI is completely different in use case terms as it was then, but we didn't keep updating the policy and procedures. I would say, I'd normally say, I've never met a technical person that puts updating a procedure top of their list of tasks until last Tuesday when I said this statement and a guy from US military says, I do. So I've met one. The rest of the world do not put this top of the list. There's always something more fun to do. There's always something more urgent. Therefore they get left and they wither on the vine and you know, the times when we've gone in and done PKI health checks and they go to the bottom drawer of the filing cabinet, open it up, dust off the cobwebs and the dust and go, here's our CP. And it hasn't been touched in years. And then, of course, um, organizations find out too late. We know this. There's plenty of breaches and, and so on. And the final one, which I always say this when there's accountants in the room that decide on the IT budgets. Best practices are often inconvenient. Two-person control, funnily enough, requires two people. So the quantum challenge is real, but it, it's not technical. So I present all over the world to lots of different verticals in our security forums, conferences, and whatever, and I'm hearing exactly the same thing from organizations, most organizations. So we've got too much to do in our day jobs, managing the cryptography that we've got, trying to maintain that assurance and meet those best practices and pass the next internal audit or the external audit if it's, if it's a certified system. We just don't have time to prepare for PQ. And then there's all of us going, prepare now, you must. It's coming, the storm's coming, we have to prepare. Thank quantum, we're all thinking. We're all thinking at last there's a generational change in cryptography that is going to drive the business to give us the money we so deserve. It's not happening. Many organizations are struggling to justify a project with no end date. Most projects have a compelling event. I have to go live by January 2024. PQ is different. We don't know when we have to be live. We know roughly we have to be ready by probably 2028, 2027, if we want to be a couple of years ahead of our adversary. In military, it's 10 years ahead. We know they're already taking on some of these new PQC and QKD uh, technologies. But in the, in the normal world, the commercial world, two years is a pretty good yardstick to be ahead. So if it's that kind of timeline, try justifying that to a board member and say, well, we think it's near the end of the decade. And they say, well, this other project is gonna generate us more revenue, re reduce our risk more and so on, and they'll put their money there. The board priorities. What's the number one board priority? AI, generative AI. Everyone talks about it. Everyone talks about the threat, the opportunity and everything. And boards are actively looking at AI and spending a lot of money. They're not looking at PQ. It doesn't, someone else presented earlier, I think, you know, PQ was not on the agenda of the board, you know. 
quantum computing is on the agenda of the board, but the defense against quantum computing isn't. So I've met a lot of banks and the, the security teams in banks say, yeah, thank quantum at last. You know, the bank's looking at quantum computing so they can make more money on trading, they can predict stocks better and everything else. And then they have their quantum meeting, quantum prep meeting, and it's two hours and 55 minutes talking about quantum opportunity. And then AOB in small brackets, security at the end, and they have five minutes. So it, it's starting to get a bit of visibility, but nowhere near enough to give it that board uh, focus. So what's a zero trust strategy? So we know the world's changed in terms of cybersecurity and the kinds of, of breaches. Um, credential compromise is probably at the forefront, and we've seen lots of recent breaches with very big organizations. I won't name them. Um, and that's accelerating. Phishing as a service is available on the dark web. With AI, it's pretty amazing. You cannot easily distinguish between an a AI generated phishing email and a, and a carefully written human one anymore. And, and with that, the attacks and the cadence of attacks are increasing. We've all had breaches. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. Um, but the frequency of breaches is, you know, it's weekly, it's daily. So we've got to change a pa our paradigm when it comes to breaches. And the costs of a breach are significant. And if they're happening more than once, these costs obviously add up. And then, of course, depending on the type of breach, if it's under GDPR, it could be a huge fine and so on and so forth. So generally, organizations are kind of looking at, you know, how do I deal with the modern threat, the deperimeterization, the, the way we work today, all those kind of changes that have contributed to our IT landscapes, the adoption of cloud and, and so on, uh, supply chain risk, and, and all of the things that have changed our IT landscapes in the last few years. And Zero Trust seems to have gained uh, its position as number one in terms of the right strategy to tackle the new way of IT. Now, it doesn't mean everyone's doing it, and I always present on Zero Trust saying, actually, it's nothing new. There's only one thing new in Zero Trust, which is assume breach. So you're looking at minimizing damage, more focus on that. The other two principles of zero trust, principle of least privilege, never trust, always verify. I mean, never trust, always verify has been there in PKI since day one. It, it's not a new fun, um, security control. Principle of least privilege has been used in military for decades. It, when an internet came along, started to be used in, an, in IT security. So it's not exactly new, and you don't have to say, oh, it's zero trust. It could be just good quality security to fit the modern, modern threats. But it's a paradigm. So I recently uh, described zero trust. I hope there's no Buddhists in the room or online. I don't mean to offend them, but it's like Buddhism. It's a way of life. It's a lot of organizations a lot of people, perhaps due to the IT vendor community, perhaps perceive it as some kind of technical architecture. And we know it's not. It's got governance, orchestration, visibility, analytics. Uh, and of course, it's got technical things in it too. But really, it's about the way you approach information security. And it's a strategy. And it does have board level visibility. A lot of the biggest organizations now at board level are talking zero trust. Notably, they're not talking post-quantum cryptography yet. So zero trust is holistic. It covers data, identity. Uh, I've just picked one of the frameworks here, the CISA zero trust maturity framework. I could have picked any one of the others. They're all about the same, following those three principles. Uh, it covers networks, micro-segmentation, it covers applications and workloads, etc. It's holistic. Some organizations start at the identity end, some start at the data end, some start in micro-segmentation in the middle and kind of spread out. Um, but it's all-encompassing. 
Now, how does it relate to a post-quantum journey? So this is a collection of analyst recommendations, expert recommendations from us and our peers. These are kind of the steps in a PQ journey. You've obviously got to establish a group to start the journey off. You need an inventory of data and the flows, and you map that to your inventory of cryptographic assets. And you're doing that mainly to prioritize the highest risk systems first. That's why I'll start looking at PQ, where I've got the greatest aggregation of data. You need to build in crypto agility. We've heard that from almost every presentation. Crypto agility is not just about tech. It involves people and process. It's, it's a process of change. And many organizations aren't particularly good at change in cryptography because we've never had to try. We haven't really been tested hard. We now are about to. So you've absolutely got to build that in, in the solutions you buy, the software you develop, and great presentation from Qualcomm explaining that uh, uh, in the mobile phone world. Modernize and defend. There's the, I've had many conversations here about systems that just can't be PQC'd. Mainframes, legacy stuff. You know, now is the time for organizations to kind of clean out uh, the wardrobe, get rid of the the old and dusty systems that cannot be or mitigated against quantum computers. Modernizing and then, of course, defending against Harvest Now, Decrypt Later, because every organization has an HR directory. That HR directory co contains long-term data. All of that data is a Harvest Now, Decrypt Later threat, big or small, depending how big your organization is. Test and migrate. PQ security management, because we'll all have learned so much over this journey, we'll be fantastic at managing crypto forevermore. And just further to the right, which I always miss off, world peace follows. Um, so, what's a zero trust journey look like when it comes to cryptography? You have a zero trust group. You establish a team. You need an inventory of data and data flows. The data column I just showed in Zero Trust is all about data classification, data in use, data at rest, data um, where it is, how it's held, how it's protected, uh, encrypted otherwise, and so on. An inventory of cryptographic assets. In the CISO one, which I picked because it makes it very clear, visibility and analytics is, is absolutely a key foundation. Inventory of cryptographic assets is visibility and risk and cost and control over those cryptographic assets and a plan and a roadmap and so on. Crypto agility is critical in maturity and in, in zero trust. You need to be able to react to threats faster. You need to be able to be agile when something becomes deprecated or a vulnerability is found. That's all part of zero trust. It happens to also be part of PQ readiness. Modernize and defend. Zero trust, yes, it uses very old and proven security controls, but applied in a modern way. And some of those controls are quite hard to apply with legacy IT and the way we, we have built our architectures today. Areas of our landscapes will have to modernize to meet zero trust as much as they have to modernize to allow agility and, and threat management when it comes to zero uh, post-quantum. Test and migrate, of course, every IT project has test and migrate. That was an easy one. Uh, and then PQ security management or zero trust security management. They're kind of one and the same when it comes to crypto. So the reason I've presented that is many organizations I've spoken to in the last nine to 12 months who are struggling to start their PQ readiness have started to add PQ readiness by stealth to another program that's already funded. Zero trust seems to be the most common one or some kind of information assurance framework. So you can get a lot of derived value from that existing act set of activities when it comes to PQ readiness. Recently in Germany, I won't name the company, they've added their PQ readiness to their AI strategy. 
they did it because boards can't stop talking about AI and quantum driven AI is really scary. Quite clever, isn't it? Okay, so looking a bit to the future. So the two journeys also help each other. So obviously there's some time to wait until we can start to apply some of these new PQC algorithms. We need the standards, we need some comfort when it comes to the implementation of the standards, testing and everything else. Although sometimes our risk is greater to harvest now, decrypt later, that we would be willing as security professionals to implement PQC very early. And some organizations are already doing that. There was a LinkedIn article today, I think, about uh, Vodafone, big telco in the UK, testing PQC for VPNs. A few weeks ago, there was QKD testing by BT and HSBC Bank. Organizations like Google are already testing PQC in production systems, and I believe that's because of the Harvest Now Decrypt Later threat. They've analyzed the risk and they've said, actually, it's safer for us to go PQC now than wait. The other things that uh, derive benefits are, of course, better cyber hygiene, better visibility and uh, control and policy decision making on cryptographic assets. That comes from both journeys. Being better and more holistic at risk assessments across our landscapes, that comes from PQ readiness. It comes from zero trust. They're one and the same. Zero trust orchestration. So that's connecting, that's the workflows, that's connecting um, the security enforcing elements uh, together so that you can spot and react to threats and incidents more quickly. You can have, um, uh, spot people tampering with syslogs and so on. You can use PQC to make it even harder for that adversary to hide their presence to manipulate your security and threat detection systems. And PQT hybrid bridge, it rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? It's really easy to say. So PQT hybrid bridge delivers crypto agility. So we've heard a lot about hybrid and many organizations have presented it yesterday and today. Um, it absolutely does add that kind of flexibility, that ability, the magic toggle to switch to PQC later when you're ready. That's got to be good for zero trust, of course, because it's about reacting to an incident, a threat or a vulnerability quickly. So I've taken some of those columns from C, so I'm not gonna go through them all, just to give other examples of where PQC can help a zero trust maturity. So in the identity column, we hear about, like I gave you the statistic about um, stolen credentials. We also have fake credentials generated. You can use PQC to protect that. You can sign the JSON logs. You can um, protect the, if you're using certificate-based authentication, you can use PQC-based certificate-based authentication. It's really hard to say. Um, but you can combine those two to give even more strength to enterprise workforce authentication. PQC on VPNs, I just mentioned an example of, of major organizations already piloting that. Um, it's all about the harvest now, decrypt later threat and mitigating that. Looking at devices, you can st strengthen the trust and the, between the comms and the trust between the endpoints and management and application services using PQC against a, your quantum adversary when that happens. We're never really sure when that's going to happen. That's part of the big problem we're challenged with. Um, you can increase security on sensitive data on endpoints, minimize damage when breached using PQC. So the sooner we can implement that, the harder it is to, you know, to uh, enact a ransomware attack or enact the actual uh, result of a ransomware attack. CM systems, you can protect log data using PQC, making it even harder to manipulate those systems and hide presence. Most ransomware attacks, as we know, the attacker is in your network at least three months before the attack is launched, looking around for the best targets and so on. And they hide their presence, of course. 
In data applications and workloads, you can encrypt sensitive data now with PQC. Some organizations already have because of that bit greater threat of harvest now, decrypt later. You can add more confidentiality and integrity to those systems. Certificate-based machine identity products um, uh, for the virtual infrastructure, you can uh, protect against both classical and quantum adversaries. And code signing with PQC, we heard about that. Um, you can prevent spoofing and maintain more integrity. So what would I recommend? So there's a free tip in here that I tell everyone whenever I present PQC. The first one, though, is <laughs> the first is combine your PQC with a pre-existing project wherever possible. The natural one is zero trust if your organization have started that journey or, or are well into that journey. That's an obvious one because of the commonalities I've presented, but it could be AI, of course it could. It could be anything that's already funded. Obviously, Elevation and Jaime presented yesterday about the first step in Banco Santander's journey was about education, elevating the message, bringing awareness. That's critical, and we need to do that. It's part of our role even though we'd much love to be focusing on the tech and getting on with our day jobs, we need to elevate this because it's not being heard. And the, one of the easiest ways to start a PQC journey is to ask all the suppliers. So I've been saying this for months. Last week, Entrust received their first security questionnaire with PQC questions in it. And it was to a bank I'd presented to six or so months ago. And I know it was me because I wrote some of the questions. But that just proves that's an organization starting on the journey. And one of the easiest things to do is just add those questions to your supply chain questionnaires, to your security assessments and everything else. Starts to elevate the message, gives you evidence to say to the board, to your bosses, there's an issue here our most critical supplier is years away from preparation or can't even tell me a PQC journey. And that can start to flag up and build the case for money and, and the journey of PQ readiness. So I think I'll leave it there. Does anyone have any questions? So do we have any questions in the room? We have one online and then I have one for you. Wonderful, well I bring this over, I'll ask my question. If I may. Sure. What, uh, what types of questions did you get um, back in that uh, third party assessment that uh, related to PQC, just for everybody's sort of information? What questions should they be asking or should they be prepared to okay. answer, depending on which well, side Well, I of can't that tell you our answers. No, no We're fair still enough. working on our answers, but um, I can tell you what the questions were. They were pretty basic. We weren't trying to catch people out, you don't in these security questionnaires because you tend not to get the kind of answer you're looking for. Are you, or do you have a PQC readiness team? That was question number one. Uh, the second question was, when do we expect to receive your products and solutions with support for the new, and we've referred to the NIST standard and algorithms, when do we, will we expect to receive that product for our testing and migration purposes? And the third question wasn't about sandwiches or sand wedges. <laughs> um, the third question was, uh, is your organization assessing your risk against your own data and our data, if you hold any of our data, for the Harvest Now Decrypt Later threat? And I think I had a couple more, but they were the three main ones. It's very useful, thank you. In the, in the room, if we could. Yeah, hi, uh, I got a question. Uh, yeah. When I have convinced my management that this is absolutely necessary and important, how do I come back, let's say in a few weeks time or a, or a month or so, uh, about metrics? Do you have any tips or suggestions how to measure things and quantify? Uh, well, uh, we know the first step is an inventory. 
and a risk assessment, not just the inventory. You've got to interpret the what you find. Um, so organizations that are in that same situation are doing small inventories and risk assessments to say, look, we've looked at this one system and we believe we have a $1 million migration project here just for this one ecosystem. And obviously encompassing the database, the application, the network, the platform, the OS, the chip, and every layer in the stack where the crypto lives. And they're saying, we've got one of these, and this one's a million, and we've got another 65 like it. So we believe this PQ journey for us as an organization is going to be one times 65. It's that kind of magnitude of scale that we need to look at and spread over the years that we believe we have, three, four, five years. It's kind of this amount of spend per year. I can't say they've been successful with that because I don't know their results, but they have done those small scale assessments because it's really, you know, you can go and boil the ocean, but in fact, what you really need is those first key metrics to say it's this kind of scale, it's this kind of size of problem. That's what the management are looking for. Yeah, I asked the question because it's also a matter of getting the right priority to make the changes. It also has to compete with other stuff that needs yeah. to be done. Which is why, you know, combining it with something else and doing it by stealth and deriving yeah. benefit from other activities that are already happening. Uh, you know, the uh, we heard yesterday, obviously, from, from NIST about the questionnaire for the inventory. You know, that's pretty hard as a first step um, to take. And some organizations we've heard and I've spoken to have taken that step too. They've sent out the questionnaire to 120 parts of the organization and they get 10 responses. You know, that's not really working. And I think Jaime talked about that as well yesterday. And then just one last question online, and, and I apologize. Uh, and by the way, I absolutely our uh, online viewers, please send in your questions as we go. They're they're great questions, but uh, sometimes we don't get to ask for clarification. So I'm going to try to interpret this one, and what I hope is in the context of the question being asked. Basically, click through licenses. You know, a lot of us just click, yeah, go ahead, and we give up a bunch of information. We never actually read what's in them. Uh, but a lot of people don't. Um, and the question is, uh, is is how do we protect ourselves in so there's this journey from getting into those situations where we inadvertently end up giving up personal information, uh, so on and so forth. So I'm wondering if you had a comment on that. Well, if the question is from a personal citizen consumer life perspective, I can't really comment. I can comment from the perspective of an organization that cares whether they're in legal compliance with all the licenses they use. And it goes back to the tip. Start asking the supply chain now. You know, start asking about that because it will affect, and you know, most EULAs in include all of the open source components and everything else, that those also have to be checked. Excellent. Well, I think with that, we'll uh, say thank you very much, Robert. A great talk. Thank you. Thank you. In today's complex, fast-paced world, you need a partner who can help secure your digital transformation so you can drive your business forward confidently. Someone who can fine-tune and integrate the secure technologies that enable mobile identities, digital payments, and a hybrid workforce. You need a partner who will have your back so you can stay focused on the road ahead and accelerate your organization's growth. Entrust, securing a world in motion.